Hello, my friends. I am Eddie Pride from Milk and Cookies Total War. Hope you all are having a fantastic Friday wherever you are in the world. And after a 3,000 year wait, Creative Assembly has finally released the Queen and the Crone DLC information that we've been waiting four months for. So the High Elves and the Dark Elves will be facing off in a Lord Pack. Two very interesting Queens will be leading their respective factions into battle. And CA Whelan and CA Guy have been kind enough to release a head-to-head -head Let's Play that gives us a bunch of juicy information. So what we're going to do is go through the gameplay they've posted and talk about everything that shows up on screen that I think is worthy of talking about. There are some really important hints and some pretty awesome explicit looks at what we're going to be getting in this DLC. So again, we're going to go through, let them do a lot of the talking. But when I see stuff that's really important, I'm going to pause it and we're just going to break it down and discuss the background, the lore, and all that. And at the end of the video, we're going to take a look at the new free LC schedule that CA has released. A lot of great information there too, so plenty of stuff to talk about. Let's get into it. We'll let them kick it off and I will pause it when I see stuff that is very much worth talking about. And I'll be pausing a lot, so if you want to watch the whole Let's Play first, I recommend you go do that. It'll be linked in the pinned comment below. Let's get started. Welcome to this Total War Warhammer 2 Queen in the Crone head-to-head -head Let's Play. I'm Wheels and I'll be playing as the Blood Queen of Harganeth, Crone Hellebron. Malevolent, malicious, and obsessed with murder and gore. Alright, so as we expected, Crone Hellebron will be leading the City of Executioners, Harganeth. So it's very fitting that she starts with her own unit of those. She also has a unit of Dreadspears and the Sisters of Slaughter. And the Sisters of Slaughter, Witch Elves, and Harganeth Executioners will all receive a minus 50% upkeep reduction. But it is important to note, I think that Hellebron's starting campaign, the start of it, is going to be quite difficult. Because you think about it, most of the units that she buffs are going to be things you get later on in your campaign. You're not going to get access to Executioners until Tier 4, and it takes a lot of investment to get up to that point. So you're going to be rocking with the starting units for a very long time. It's great she starts with them but it's going to be a little bit tough. One thing I do want to point out real quick are the Sisters of Slaughter stats. So we're going to fast forward just a teeny bit here. Hellebron brings bloody fury to the Dark Elves. So this is a really interesting, unique unit, and there are a couple of things that immediately jump out to me in terms of their unit stats. Take a look at their armor. Obviously, they're basically naked, so five armor makes a lot of sense. They are going to have a dodge passive. You can see that physical resistance right here. So that will end up being between 10 and 20% similar to what the gutter runners are already rocking with with the Skaven. They have poison attacks, which was nerfed from Total War Warhammer 1 to Total War Warhammer 2, but poison on any unit that has high melee attack is going to be pretty impactful. It's a great debuff and melee defense of 60, which is pretty insane. Now, we take a look here for a second. They are subject to murderous mastery, not just murderous prowess. So when you get to the middle to late stages of a battle, they're going to be kicking some serious ass if they're not already dead. Obviously, they're going to be insanely squishy. The dodge passive will help out a lot there. And they have the Trial of Blades augment that is an active, I believe. And what essentially, it won't be able to be popped unless they're losing combat, I don't believe. But it'll help turn the tide. If they're losing, you pop that. And essentially, in tabletop, what it did was... If you have stats that are lower than the unit you're currently combating, you could pop that augment and they would get plus one to hit and plus one to wound, I believe. So basically just helped kick them into high gear if they're losing. Now the other interesting thing about that is again, they are the followers of Eldrazor, Lord of Blades, who's an elven god, a part of the Sithrai pantheon. And they use these razor whips that can kind of arc themselves around enemy shields and still slice up enemies. So one of the cool things about Sisters of Slaughter on the tabletop was that they were able to completely mitigate or nullify enemy rank bonuses. So that basically helps explain why they're able to do the damage they're able to do, right? Because they're able to use these whips to kind of arc over the top of enemy shield walls and still hit their targets. And they're very hard to get a read on. They move incredibly... It's incredibly hard to get a read on what they actually do in combat because they have these crazy weapons. They have a very weird fighting style because they're from these gladiate Atris pits in Harganath. And essentially they're just able to flip over the top of shield walls and attack and do lots of crazy stuff. So I think the way they've been represented here is really cool. I think it's going to be a very interesting unit, kind of like the Slayers. Very low armor, but very high on DPS and very high melee defense, which is pretty cool as well. 
and I'm Guy, and I'm taking control of Alariel the Radiant, aka the Ever Queen and High Priestess of Isha. High Elves adore her, and for good reason. Unlike Ever Queens before her, she takes an active role in the defense of Ulthor. Okay, so she's gonna start with Alariel the Ever Queen. We'll be starting with Sisters of Avalorn. As we imagined, they are going to be armor piercing missiles with flaming attacks and magical attacks all rolled into one. So think of the Starfire Shafts kind of on steroids. These were one of the best shooting units in the entire tabletop game in 8th edition. I believe they were relatively on par with Way Watchers. They have 180 range, so pretty standard for high elf missile units. But the AP missiles is going to give them a very unique role in the high elf roster. They're going to be very expensive, but you're going to be paying for those, right? They have great, well, not great, but very decent melee stats. 36 melee attack, 38 melee defense. AP missiles always going to be amazing, and that's going to help a lot in terms of the missile fight they're going to typically have with the Dark Elves. Those Dark Shards, the AP is a really big deal. It's going to be a big deal here. Now, Alarial, because of her connection to nature and the fact that she is one of two avatars of Isha on the mortal plane, the other, of course, being Ariel, who is not in the game quite yet for the Wood Elves. Hopefully, she gets there at some point. She's going to start with Tree Ken, Dryads, and she's also going to have access to Tree Men, who are going to have their own unique skin in Avalorn in the Gaian Vale, so I like that. I think it's a really nice touch that's going to add a lot of flavor to her campaign. Urging an end to petty infighting to ensure the integrity of an Ulthoran for the Azert. In this new Lord pack, players will be able to pit these mortal enemies against each other in both the Eye of the Vortex and Mortal Empires campaigns. Guy and I will once again be at each other's throats in this head-to-head -head multiplayer Let's Play. You join me on turn 7, where I've managed to wrestle control of the entire province of the Road of Skulls. Crone Hellebron has pushed into the territory of the Deadwood Sentinels and sparked a territory war with her brethren. My first action will be to level up Hellebron after her success in taking the Black Pillar. I'm going to be further upgrading her abilities as a dreaded slaver. Rank 2 gains an extra 12% of casualties captured post-battle for my burgeoning slave market. And those slaves are going to be the bloody lubricant for my unending assault on- Did somebody say bloody lubricant? I think Slanesh is very pleased. Oh, for Crone Hellebron may appear to be young and beautiful, but it is only the ritual of the Death Knight that keeps her from withering. Alright, so this is going to be the Blood Queen bar at the top. It's going to be her unique mechanic. So the entire point of Crone Hellebron is that she is insanely old. One of the oldest characters in the entire setting. Within Nagarond, or Nagaroth rather, the Dark Elves culture in general, I believe only Marathi and Malekith are older characters. There may be one or two others, but she is insanely old, multiple thousands of years old, and so Marathi has hidden the secrets of the Cauldron of Blood, her own sorceries, and prevented anyone else from being able to use those and keep eternal youth. With the elves, they will still wither and kind of look uglier as they get super, super old, super ancient. It's very uncommon for elves to even live to remotely as old as Crone Hellebron has, but she's basically a shriveled old hag. That's why she's called a crone. And once a year, she calls Blood Knight, which is going to be her other unique mechanic we'll hear in a second, where she basically bathes in the blood of all the victims, the slaves that are unleashed on the streets of Harganeth, and everything gets slaughtered. She becomes youthful and vigorous once again. So when she has that bar filled, when you've just called Death Knight, you're going to be getting some pretty big buffs. Plus six public order, Lords are going to have better loyalty. Vigor loss reduction for Hellebron is very nice. And of course, that physical resistance for Crone Hellebron and the Witch Elves. So some pretty nice buffs. But when Death Knight rolls away and it's kind of been gone for a while, you're going to start be getting some pretty serious debuffs. So you're going to have to balance the slave mechanic and killing these slaves, which are a big part of your economy. And the impact that will have on your economy is going to be pretty ginormous, I think, especially in the early game. It'll be interesting to see how that balances out. But you have to balance the slaves and you have to balance the buffs that Blood Queen will be getting herself. Into her true form. With the blood sacrifice of a multitude of slaves on the streets of Harganeth, Hellebron's beauty and power will be restored as she emerges from a pool of her victim's gore. The powers of the Death Knight are not everlasting though. Yeah, you can see some of those debuffs there. Minus 10% tax rate, minus 12 public order is huge. That's not going to be fun. So one of the things you're going to notice throughout this Let's Play for both Alarial and for Hellebron is they're going to have some really unique campaigns simply because of these debuffs. They're going to be pretty challenging. I think some amongst the most challenging in Mortal Empires overall. You look at what you're getting here. 
minus 12 public order is really hard to deal with. You're going to be dealing with a lot of rebellions, especially if you're dealing with a slave. Uh, not surplus, whatever the opposite of a surplus is. My brain's not working very well right now. But you know what I mean? If you're running out of slaves and you're not able to call Blood Knight, you're going to be in serious problem there. Minus 12 public order is a big deal. So is minus 15 leadership for all your armies. Now, there are ways to mitigate these public order penalties, which we'll see a little bit later on. But it's very important to take note. If you let this become an issue for you, it's going to be impactful. It's not going to be one of those debuffs where you're like, oh, who cares? Minus two public order. I'll just build a public order building. There's nothing in the game that's going to be able to cover minus 12. And that means a lot of rebellions will be coming your way. And as time marches on, Hellebron's guise of youth will begin to diminish into her true form, causing massive penalties to her effectiveness on the battlefield and also to the running of her nation. So without further ado, Let's begin our assault on Dargoff and capture some new slaves for our sacrifice. As this is a head-to-head -head campaign, Guy will be taking control of my enemies. He'll be even more unpredictable and difficult to battle. The city of Dargoff is mine, and with it an enormous bounty of slaves with which to enact my machinations. It's time to unleash the slaves from their cages and begin the hellish fury of the Death Knight that we might bathe in Cain's bloody splendor. People of Hageneth now have leave to unleash their primal instincts upon the bounty of slaves we have provided. Those who are not sated will assemble in a blood voyage to the shores of Ulthuan to appease their lust for death. So one thing we should take note of right here, every time you call Death Knight, it looks like the slave requirement is going to go up by 100 and that might even be going up even more by the time you get to the later stages of your game. So that in and of itself will be pretty important. There's going to come a point, of course, in any campaign where if you're doing well, you're going to snowball and the slave requirement will not be a big deal whatsoever. But as you're talking about calling Blood Knights, successive Blood Knights early on, when you're at turn 30 or turn 40 or turn 50, might be a serious issue. So, well, again, one thing that I mentioned, the thing that makes the Dark Elf economy so incredible, what makes them such a snowbally race in Mortal Empires and Great Vortex campaigns are the slave economy in general. You can get Nagarond, for instance. Malekith starts there, only two or three cities away from where Harganath is right now to the west. You can get absolutely insane economies going where you have 3,000, 4,000 gold a turn just from that one settlement. If you're constantly murdering all your slaves to keep Halebron's buffs up, that means your economy is going to suffer tremendously and fielding multiple stacks will be harder. So your early start will be much slower than for Nagaron, for Marathi, or for Tyri and some of the other elven factions in Mortal Empires. An addiction is never satisfied by equal measures though. We'll have to provide more slaves each time we carry out another Death Knight. On the next turn, the Blood Voyage is ready to set sail, and if this were a single player campaign, they would only listen to our demands if Ulfwan had been purged of those vapid High Elves. But in a head-to-head -head campaign, I have complete control. Okay, I actually didn't know that. I'm not sure I love that. I kind of like the idea of being able to use the Blood Voyage whenever you feel like it. I thought we would have complete control of it in a single player campaign. Apparently not. So I don't even know if you're going to be able to use the army yourself. Maybe it means that you can fight the battles for them, but you won't be able to control where they attack. But what it does mean is if you're not playing Hellebron in the campaign, this Blood Voyage that spawns when you call Blood Knight or Death Knight is going to go directly for Ulth 1. Which is good. One of the things I was a little bit worried about before this came out in, uh, uh, was if Crone Hellebron and her faction would actually end up attacking Ulth 1 whatsoever. Obviously, you want to have that thematic matchup. You want to see a lot of invasions between the two factions. Having a automatic stack occasionally attack Ulth 1 will be very good, especially when we consider all of Alero's mechanics, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. So apparently it's only in head-to-head -head that you'll have full control of this. I would like to be able to use it whenever. I mean, it's a stack that I'd like to be able to use, but let's see a little bit more about what's happening with this mechanic here. The Blood Voyage is incredibly powerful with unbreakable units, an 80% upkeep reduction, and a 30% increase in campaign movement range. So yeah, I mean, there's some super nice buffs there. It's not gonna cost very much at all to field this full stack. It's got some really good units, two units of Dread Knights, you got a Black Dragon and a Hydra. We got some crap units in there as well, plenty of Bleak Swords and Dread Spears. Uh, so it's not going to cost a lot. It's going to have a lot of range, so it'll quickly be able to close the gap between Ulthwan and Nagaroth. And of course, you'll get those diplomatic relation debuffs with the High Elves as well. 
as it should be. They should be killing the crap out of each other. They've only been doing that for thousands upon thousands of years, and everything in there will be unbreakable. So this really does seem like it's going to be a great head-to-head -head campaign matchup. Maybe a little bit less interesting in single player, at least this particular mechanic, but yeah, I'll get over it. However, whilst it remains, our faction will be incredibly unpopular with High Elves, for obvious reasons, and the army itself will never replenish, meaning any damage done is permanent. Let's send our band of marauders to their goal and start to bring the wrath of Cain on the gleaming towers of Ulfheim. Enough wheels. Let's have a look at my campaign so far. I started here at the Game Vale and succeeded in cleansing the Druki in my immediate vicinity, pushing them out past the Phoenix Gate with the help of my friends from the forest. Alariel's affinity for nature allows her to open ancient portals to the forest ways of the world, granting her access to units usually only accessible to Wood Elves. Using my prestigious position as the widely adored Ever Queen of Ulthoran, I've started spending my influence to create coalitions and calm inter Azur conflicts. My first priority is encouraging the egos of Ulthoran to put their differences aside and drive the Dark Elves out. I'm not just being a xenophobe, Alariel's Defender of Ulthoran mechanic incentivizes her matriarchal protection of these sacred lands. The more of Ulthoran under High Elf control, the more its people trust the Everqueen. You know what? I just realized I forgot something, so let's go back real quick. It's 4.15 is where we are right now. We're going to look right at the beginning. The head let's play. I'm Wheels, and I'll be playing as the Blood Queen of Harganeth, Crone Hellebron. Malevolent Militia. Alright, so this is going to be our first look at Alathanar as well. I can't believe I forgot that. That was one of, I mean, When I was preparing for this video, it was the first thing I wanted to talk about. Alathanar is right there, and we're going to be talking about him on the free LC schedule as well. Very, very cool character. I'm extremely ecstatic that he got added as a free LC, and he'll actually have his own units as well. Basically, a range-focused lord that can DPS down any monster or lord. Basically has a bolt thrower as his bow. It hits like a Mack truck. Should be able to kill multiple models per shot and slaughter any big entity because it's going to be very easy to hit them. I imagine he'll have great accuracy. So, I like the model there. We're going to get a better look at him a little bit earlier or later on. Um, but yeah, I can't believe I forgot about that. We're going to be taking a good look at Althanar very soon. He might even be end up being the highlight of this entire DLC and update for me. Let's go back to 415 real quick. Where are you at? Right there. The more its people trust the Everqueen. In the first case, that means setting a war coordination target here at the Tower of Lycian, where I believe Prince Tyrion has been taking handouts on the side rather than putting his people first. In the campaign, this translates to a variety of positive or negative effects to various aspects of the running of my faction. So one of the things that I think is a little bit interesting about how they've implemented it here, we know that for Vlad and Isabella, they are lovers, of course. They've been they've known each other since I believe 1950 or so of the Imperial calendar, which is about 550 years before the start of Total War Warhammer's campaign. It doesn't seem like there's actually interactions between Tyrion and Alario. At least they haven't been revealed yet. So you know how. You can recruit Vlad as part of Isabella's faction once you get to a certain point in her campaign. They've got a lot of buffs when they're in the same army together, and you can roll them together. Doesn't seem like that'll be the case for Tyrion, who is the consort of the Everqueen, and obviously there's a lot of interplay with their relationship there. But I would have liked to have seen an ability where maybe you could field Tyrion as part of Alariel's army. Not 100% sure that it's not going to be in the campaign, but they haven't talked about it, and I would have figured they would have unveiled that by this point. Most important is that no external forces breach the inner ring of Ulthuan. Let's take roll back real quick there. Is that no ex There are some gigantic debuffs for Alarial as well. Like I said, it's going to be a really hard start to both campaigns, and you're not going to have Ulthuan completely under your control or under high elf control early on. And if you're at war with other high elf factions, that will also lead to debuffs. So if anything gets raised on this entire continent, things are going to be a little bit problematic for you, and you're going to be dealing with a lot of public order penalties, and I think this interplay is going to make Ulthuan just a lot more interesting. We know how Tyrion starts off with one of the easiest starts in the entire campaign in Lothar, an incredibly powerful port city, and you basically just take your time getting the whole place under your control, but there seems to be a lot more mechanics now that are going to make Ulthuan a lot more interesting and a lot more challenging. And I think that's what was really needed, because 
Tyrion had way too easy of a start. Alariel is not going to have an easy start, and I think all the interplay that we'll be working with her politicking and her trying to bring the whole island continent under her control and basically making it peaceful, getting the Dark Elves kicked out of there, I think it'll make for a lot more interesting mechanics for Tyrion as well. So it's going to be helping out a lot of other campaigns. We don't know exactly where Alethanar will be starting just yet. It looks like, I think we're on, yeah, we're on turn 10 here, and the Scourge of Cain, this orange faction, it's a reference to uh, Malice Darkblade actually, so hopefully we see him at some point soon. But they've taken over Nagarith completely, and I don't know if that's because Alethanar got wiped out, or if he's starting somewhere else, maybe further west in Arnheim, near Morathi, or maybe infiltrating somewhere in Nagaroth. I think it would be pretty good, actually, for Alethanar to get his own unique star position that is outside of Ulthuan, as interesting as it would be to have him in Old Nagarith and near Tor Anlek and near the Shrine of Cain. I think that maybe a little bit more of an interesting star position could be on an enemy continent where you're completely surrounded by enemies, and it would make a lot of sense with his lore and with his boss with Shadow Warriors as well. External forces breach the inner ring of Ulthuan. The effects that will have on the infrastructure of my kingdom will leave the gleaming towers of Avalon in the shadows of chaos. The purge of the Druki from northern Ulthuan has been slow but steady as we begin to oust the scourge of Cain from the outer ring. There is yet more cause for concern though, as it seems that wretched, rancid hag Helebron is dredging up more abominations for her trespasses on our lands but I couldn't possibly prepare for the devastation that is about to unfold. It's now turn 29, and we're still reeling from Wheel's blood voyage, desecrating the lands of Ulthuan. So as we know, all of Nagarith is basically wasteland because of the Sundering, when those huge, gigantic, Black Ark Fortress Citadels were taken up, and the entire continent was literally sundered by Malekith and his sorcerers. The entirety of the northwestern portion of Ulthuan was turned to wasteland. So... One of the things that I think could make Alethanar very cool is if he can only settle in wasteland type regions or snowy type regions as well. That would make him a kind of faction leader that you wouldn't want to colonize all of Ulthuan because the normal places that they like, like the guy in Vale, like Lothurn, would be bad for him and bad for his faction. You want to be encouraged with a faction leader like Alethanar to go over to Nagaroth and colonize over there. So I think that's one way they're going to differentiate him there. It looks like Alariel has still colonized Tor Anlek. She's going to be getting some debuffs there. Let's take a listen to what he has to say as Guy conquers more and more of the northern west, northwest portion of Ulthuan and basically kicks the Dark Elves' collective asses out of there. Though our friends have recolonized some of the runes left in his wake, he managed to crack the inner ring of Ulthuan by taking it the Unicorn Gate, and with it, its sizable garrison. We'll have to round up our strongest warriors and call on our most loyal allies to take it back. Unfortunately, by siding with Tyrannoch, the faction wheels focus during his invasion, I've put myself at odds with my most valuable neighbor, Illyrian, who they are currently at war with. This leaves a particularly bitter taste because I used my hard-earned influence to secure this alliance. My most fearsome rivals have taken a key strategic location on my very doorstep, and my fellow Azur continue to squabble. At the very least, we can keep our own followers contented by utilizing Alariel's power over nature. Whenever Alariel visits a friendly settlement, those lucky enough to witness her presence are blessed with a variety of bonuses for a 10 turn duration, including growth, public order, and a corruption reduction, certainly useful as she gallivants around Ulthuan, protecting and uniting her people. I really like that. I mean, it's a pretty obvious addition to Alariel's campaign because her entire lore is based on her ability to purify chaotic taint from the world, but giving her public order and giving her that untainted bonus of plus five, which is pretty huge, and I imagine you'll be able to get that even larger once you get further into her skill tree. I want to see her be able to purge chaotic influence from a region in only a couple of turns. I don't want to... 
It's already annoying enough dealing with that kind of thing in the late stages with other faction leaders. I want her to be able to get in and to really differentiate her, she should be able to purify it, make it 100% untainted without, I'm not talking like two or three turns, but she should be able to do it way faster than most other legendary lords in the game. So that's her entire point. And that public order bonus will be very nice as well, of course. Back to the Road of Skulls, and we can see that Hellebron's iron grip over her homeland has started to weaken as her powers have faded, revealing her wrinkled mortality to all the world. We do not have the luxury of Marathi's secrets, keeping her young and beautiful without the need for constant sacrifice, and thus we call for another Death Knight. If we wish to end the eternal cycle of aging and sacrifice, we must provide a substantial offering to the bloody-handed god who demands from us his tribute. If we manage to take control of Marathi's capital, we can pilfer her secrets of immortality, raising the minimum level we can fall to on the Death Knight bar. So I really like that mechanic as well. There are two regions in the campaign map that will basically allow you to buff up Marathi to a point, or not Marathi, sorry. That is some heresy right there. Hellebron is pissed that I just said that. What I mean is you're going to be able to look at the bar here and you see how each, there are, I guess, five separate segments of this, right? If you are able to capture Marathi's lair at the ancient city of Quintex and you're able to capture Alarial's grove, at the Gaian Vale, you will actually never drop below the middle threshold, which will basically mean that you never get big debosses Hellebron, even when you're in your crone state and not invigorated by all the blood from Death Knight. That'll be super nice. Now, of course, capturing the ancient city of Quintex, it's really far away. That will take 60, 70, maybe 80 turns to even get to that point, probably, unless you decide to just bum rush it. Same with the Gaian Vale. But it's a nice mechanic that means that the further you get in the campaign, the less you'll have to worry about those debuffs because if you get to that point, Hellebron's obviously gotten much more potent, much more powerful, and it's a very flavorful way to basically add another little twinge to that mechanic that I think is really interesting. The same effect can also be achieved by occupying the home of our most hated rival, Alariel, the Gain Vale. By destroying her grove and erecting our twisted monuments, Cain will surely be pleased. In the last few turns, the diminishing loyalty of our Blood Voyage captain saw them turn against us. Driven mad by their thirst for blood, they threw themselves at our newly captured Unicorn Gate and were swiftly dealt with. It's time to prepare for another assault on Ulf One then. First, let's upgrade our torture posts into fully fledged fighting pits that we might recruit one of- That is very cool. So, public order is obviously a really important component of the Dark Elves because you want to... Every time you get a massive amount of influx of slaves, you're going to have public order issues. So in a lot of your settlements, you're going to be building these fighting pits. I remember my first campaign with Malekith in Nagarond. I dealt with a lot of public order issues, but I built a lot of those. And when you build up public order, you can get all the economic bonuses of having a lot of slaves and not deal with any of the negatives. So you look at the fighting pits here, Sisters of Slaughter will be a component there. So they're not gonna be recruited from your typical military buildings, none of the red line. You're gonna be getting them from the public order. And I believe that might be the only unit in the campaign so far for any faction that you can actually pick up from public order buildings. I could be wrong about that. Please correct me if I am, but I like that addition right there as well. With the new units at our disposal. The Sisters of Slaughter. These crazed gladiators are expert damage dealers and will tear a high off shield wall asunder. The only thing left to do now is to unleash the slaves from their cages and once again revel in the glory of the Death Knight. Next turn and my blood voyage is here, ready to enact its brutal fury on the Isles of the Azure. I've only just noticed, however, that Guy's faction is in control of the Shrine of Cain. We cannot allow these contemptuous cowards to wield the mighty power of the God of Murder. I must have the blade for myself. I love Wheels role-playing, by the way. I think it adds a really nice touch. I know you guys love role-play campaigns. I think this kind of thing is super fun. I mean, I imagine it took him a long time to put together, but I do want to praise him and Guy here because doing this kind of head-to-head -head campaign, when you've got that extra Warhammer flavor, it adds a really nice touch that I think a lot of people really enjoy. Let us see how the Ever Queen's warriors deal with true destruction. And this time, she will have the pleasure of my company as well. Ooh. Spicy. Ooh. 
Two full stacks loom on the horizon and I don't feel strong enough to take them on. To make matters worse, the Illyrians, who won't talk to me since they formed an alliance with Tyrannoch, just smashed a full stack into the Dark Elf controlled Unicorn Gate without coordinating with me. The really juicy stuff is about to show up, so get ready for that. There's a lot to talk about coming up right here. And got absolutely devastated. I'm no closer to uniting the Azur as they war and squabble between themselves. Defender my plans the lie in ruins throw. and my children are in grave danger. A mother does whatever it takes to protect her children and the Ever Queen is the mortal embodiment of Isha, mother goddess of the elven race. I have no choice in the matter. I must elect a champion to take on the vile burden of the Shrine of Cain. The Widowmaker. The Sword of Cain will grant me an eye-bulging amount of armor piercing, melee attack and ward save stats. It also grants access to a devastating bound ability in the form of a vortex spell that decimates even large groups of armored troops. The vortex even inflicts temporary madness on impacted soldiers, causing them to rampage out of control. Okay. This is one of the coolest mechanics I've seen in any Total War campaign ever. This is awesome. This is the kind of thing that adds an insane amount of roleplay, an insane amount of replayability, and is going to make for some mind-boggling content if someone actually decides to go full roleplay. So, to give a little bit of backstory here, I'm sure most of you know it, but I'm going to give it for those who don't. The Sword of Cain, the Widowmaker, was on the Shrine of Cain when, and well, Cain, first off, Cain is the Lord of Murder. He is the top pantheon of the Dark Elves. He is the top god. He is the big dick god for the Sith Rai. He is extremely important in all of Elven lore, both for the High Elves and the Dark Elves. When Anerion the Defender, the most powerful lord in the history of Elven society, and the ancestor of both Malekith and Tyrion, when he was being overrun, when his empire was being completely overrun by the demonic invasions thousands of years ago, he decided after he lost his wife and he was grieving and just completely overwhelmed by bereavement, he was like, I need to do something to save my empire. And so he took upon a great sacrifice to himself, which was pull out the Widowmaker, which he knew would completely corrupt his soul and his very essence. He was a good person. He was a good elf. He was incredibly brave, incredibly handsome. Everything about him was awesome. And he drew this and he knew that its magics would completely overwhelm him and destroy him. But he saw no other way. He realized the entire planet is being overrun. I need to do something. So he drew this sword and he went to war and he smashed entire legions of demons by himself. He soloed greater demons. In fact, in his last stand, he fought a bloodthirster, a lord of change, a great unclean one, and a keeper of secrets. Nakari was one of those that he fought and killed. He killed Nakari twice and basically just went to war, slaughtered everything, and became a literal demigod most powerful character in the entire setting, in the history of the entire setting, probably barring some magic casters like Lord Croak. But he was crazy. So what this allows you to do here is when you draw this, you're going to become a god. You're going to become an absolute monster in melee. When you think of Tyrion's um, Heir of Anerion skill tree, that's going to be, the synergy there is absolutely crazy because he can already solo armies when he goes down that skill tree but you think about him being able to draw it here, look at the buffs that you're getting at level one when it's thirsting. And the important thing to remember here is this is only level one. The Sword of Cain will continuously over the course of the campaign as you win battle after battle, grow in power. So you're gonna be getting buff after buff after buff. It will not surprise me if you're getting up to like 1500 plus AP damage. You're gonna be like three shotting any unit or Lord in the entire game. With that said, though, there are some massive debuffs as well. As you can imagine, when you become a literal incarnation of a Lord of Murder, when you become the Avatar of Cain, people are not going to like you very much. So your diplomatic bonuses are going to go down the toilet. No one's going to like you. Everyone's going to start declaring war on you because as that grows in power, you're going to be getting bigger and bigger diplomatic malices. You're going to be getting bigger and bigger public order penalties, bigger and bigger debuffs for your campaign side of things. So while you're a god on the battlefield, you're going to be a crappy leader. And which is exactly what happened to Anerion as well. All the warmth, all the compassion, all the awesome things about him kind of disappeared when he drew the sword. So you look at level 1, plus 50, 450 AP damage, plus 25 melee attack, 20% ward save. 
magical attacks, and the Sword of Cain ability, which is going to be a vortex that will absolutely shred through even highly armored stuff and make him unbreakable. He can also rampage, so you'll get the Madness of Cain. Very, makes a lot of sense. You get in the thick of the fighting, the sword takes over, says, I want blood, and you're going to kill everything in sight, but you're going to lose control of your character, which won't matter when he's a god, and you're going to be doing this vortex spell as well. So, really flavorful addition. Well, I, what we don't know yet is if you're able to draw the sword if you're another faction. So, we know that High Elves can, any High Elf Lord, so Tyrion can pull it, any generic Lord for any of the High Elf sub-factions can, same for the Dark Elves. We don't know if Orion will be able to sail over from Athel Lorien and pull the sword. That would be insanely cool. I hope that's how it works, but it might be that it's only for High Elves and for Dark Elves. This will, by the way, this mechanic will be part of the free LC. It is not part of the DLC, so you'll get access to it, whether you buy the DLC or not, which I really like as well. But yeah, the amount of role playing you could do here, especially in game three when the Demons of Chaos come, trying to reenact or yeah, reenact the uh, Neri on the Defender stand against the Tides of Chaos. So cool. I'm really glad they added this. Yes, it's not the most realistic thing because some random bum can't just pull the sword. Even Malekith, even Tyrion, until the very, very, very end of all things, were like, we're not going to use this sword. It was only when he was completely overcome by absolutely terrible stuff that he needed to do it. But in terms of flavor, I love it. Some people, some lore purists might not like it as much. I think it's an awesome addition. Ignoring orders as Cain's thirst for blood overcomes them. However, this level of malevolent darkness cannot merely lurk on the fringes. It seeps into the very fabric of your soul until everything you once held dear is lost to you. As the strength of the sword grows, its tendrils strengthen their grip on the wielder, sending them into a bloody fury. The overwhelmingly powerful battlefield effects will bring with them massive penalties to your campaign, starting with a minor cost of public order and diplomacy and tumbling ever more into madness as the sword feeds on the blood of your victims. You will have opportunities to throw away the sword, but let its power drive you for too long and you will find yourself bound to its corruption until you are finally defeated in battle and the Widowmaker claims a new host. Now, it is also important for me to mention that because they're showing this Widowmaker mechanic in this Let's Play, this is not going to be what the hint was at the end of the DLC page. So if you remember, just got a text. I'm going to mute my phone real quick. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, if we think about the end of that DLC page, one of the things that characterized it, of course, was we got that big hint that something monstrous was being unchained and ready to be unleashed once the DLC drops. A lot of people thought it might be the Widowmaker they were referring to, some kind of mechanic with that, that is going to be in this DLC, which is great. But even better news, that is not going to be what they were hinting at. So there is something still yet unrevealed there. Uh, my money is going to be on a monster unit because the way they've used monstrous in that text makes me think that it will be. So either Charybdis or Medusa, we don't know which one it will be yet, and it could still be something else, but I did want to make that clear that Widowmaker will not be the thing that's being unchained. What news? Our preparation time is over. Wills is dangerously close to our gates. If he manages to take the Widowmaker, then surely all is lost. I've had to be hasty in my recruitment, my over-reliance on ranged units means that the superior Dark Elf infantry will have no trouble breaching my front line. Fortunately, I've been able to grab a large contingent of Dryads to act as a tar pit for Wheel's forces as we rain fire upon them. I've got two powerful new units to bring into the fight. The Sisters of Avalon's armor-piercing magical damage will destroy most targets easily, and their brilliant blue flames will light up the skies and purge the flesh from their bones. Shiny! The Shadow Warriors will serve a different purpose. Alright, so this is the first look we've gotten at Shadow Warrior stats. They're going to have 180 range, which seems base for pretty much all Elven units. Now, look at their melee stats. Pretty good. 37 melee attack, 29 melee defense. It's not bad at all. They will be able to defend themselves relatively well. They will have stock. They will have Vanguard deployment. They will not have armor-piercing missile damage. So again, this will kind of be the mid-tier archer that performs like the Deepwood Scouts. They have fire while moving. They have Vanguard. They can ambush from many different angles, but again, ambushing with archers is not so good. You're typically going to want them with your army or at least a little bit ahead with cavalry support nearby so they don't get run over. But the fire while moving, the being able to fire in a three... Uh, actually, I don't know if they can fire in 360 degree arc, but they can fire while moving. Um, it, it's going to be a very interesting unit. 
A lot of utility there. You have a lot of options with them, which I like quite a bit. I think they're going to be quite a lot of fun. I love Deepwood Scouts. They were one of my most used units in Total War Warhammer 1. And they actually got buffed over to Total War Warhammer 2. So I do expect these Shadow Warriors, if they're at a decent price, to be relatively effective and used quite a bit. At least have some niche picks, uh, pick options in multiplayer. So I'm definitely looking forward to see them. And especially when they're buffed up by Aleth and Nar, it'll be a lot of fun. As master ambushers, these units can deploy almost anywhere. Stay hidden in all terrain and fire whilst running. I will combine them with the Heralds of the Wind Regiment of Renown to forge an infuriating skirmisher vanguard to keep Wheels frustrated and Dread distract Lord. him from my less mobile ranged units. Scouting Wheels' Druki hordes, he's packing both a Black Dragon and a War Hydra. So the Scions of Mathalan Regiment, with their beefy anti-large stats, combined with a damage protection aura, will come in extremely handy when backing up my Handmaiden, who is a master at felling large foes in order to protect the Radiant Everqueen. Alari. By the way, we just saw that that uh, handmaiden is called Josepharius Daltarian, so that's a nice uh, little reference to Joseph or Josephine Dalton there. I like that, Joey. Um, that's cool. That's a nice little touch. But yeah, so we get a look at this army here, and a lot of archers, a lot of firepower there for sure. And that is one thing that characterizes a lot of high elf campaigns in the early game. You're gonna feel a lot of high elf archers, a lot of Lothar and Seaguard, and. I think it's really cool that they're getting all these ranged options because they are amongst the shootiest factions in the entire setting. And one thing that I think a lot of people think about when they think about Wood Elves is like, Wood Elves should be absolutely way better than every other faction in terms of shooting. And they do have the best archers, but High Elves are not far behind them. And Sisters of Avalorn and their top tier stuff will absolutely be able to compete with the Wood Elf stuff. Now, Way Watchers obviously add a different amount of utility. They've got the stock. They don't have Snipe, but they have the 360 degree fire arc. They're more mobile, but in terms of raw DPS, Sisters of Avalorn, very close. And in fact, they might actually surpass Waywatcher. So it'll be very interesting to see that combination in the campaign or multiplayer and see who has that final advantage. But both are amongst the most top tier archers in the entire setting. Evergreen, driving back the dark. Driving Enough back story. The dark. We know what needs to be done. For the Azur. For Avalorn. For our home. <laughs> Very cool. That is the Shrine of Cain, by the way. So it looks like it has gotten a new map. Again, one of the things about these free LC or DLC updates, they always come with a bunch of new maps. We are going to get a good look at the Shrine of Cain itself here, which I'm very excited for. It should be a really fun thematic battle map to fight over. Oh, that Vortex looks so sexy! We've only just scratched the surface of all the content in the Queen of the Crown, so make sure you join us on Total War Live on the 23rd for more gameplay. pre now for 10% off. Blood runs, anger rises, death wakes, war calls. It's going to be a really fun DLC. I'm very much looking forward to it. And the final reveal of what will be showing up, whatever it is, whether it's a monster, whether it's some kind of unique game mechanic or something else, whatever comes after the DLC is finally launched, I'm really looking forward to it. It's been a long wait and it's awesome to see this. So what we're going to do now is shift over, take a look at the free LC schedule, talk a little bit about what's on display there and then we'll finish up the video hope you guys enjoyed this look and i'll see you in a second and this is our free lc schedule what's coming out on may 31st now obviously there's another free lc schedule that shows what's coming further in the future in terms of legendary lords or maybe a race pack i don't know if we'll be getting a free lc race in total war warhammer 2 i would actually bet money that we don't i think bretonia was a one-off kind of thing it'd be awesome if we got it but no idea if it'll happen or not, but there's a lot of cool stuff here. So obviously we've already covered all the DLC stuff. I'm not going to cover that too much. Althanar the Shadow King, my most anticipated high elf lord for sure. He's going to have some new campaign features. We'll be covering 
all his information once we actually get the info about it. I don't want to do too much speculation here, but there are a couple things that are of note. Shadow Walkers. He does have a new, new unique unit of those. Don't know exactly what that will be. I have a feeling it will be an upgraded version of Shadow Warriors, which makes sense, right? When you think about it, Shadow Walkers are the captain upgraded version, the leader of units of Shadow Warriors in the tabletop. And so a unit of Shadow Walkers could obviously function as a higher tier version of Shadow Warriors. And I would imagine the hand of the Shadow Crown would be a Regiment of Renown that is a Shadow Walker as well. Now there's a couple other things it could be. It is possible a Shadow Walker is a hero type, a new one that is very similar to the Waystalker for the Wood Elves that would only be in Nagarith and a part of the High Elf roster. And in that case, it would kind of be like the Handmaiden or the Waystalker, not Handmaiden, yeah, Handmaiden or the Waystalker. Kind of a hero type that always accompanies Alethanar, has very high range DPS, single target damage, and maybe some kind of magic missile that can deal damage to groups of enemy cavalry, something like that. Hand of the Shadow Crown makes me think that's a less likely option, simply because you can't really do an ROR version of a hero. That doesn't really work that well. But Hand of the Shadow Crown in and of itself could be that hero type because it is not plural. Hand of the Shadow Crown could just be a single entity, while the Shadow Walkers are the upgraded full unit version of Shadow Warriors. We'll find out soon enough, I'm sure, but I think those are very interesting little additions there, and I like that they're adding more on top of what the Shadow King will already be rocking with. For Norska, obviously we've got new monsters, we've got new text coming. Dwarf update, this is the first literal confirmation that CA's done that there will be a new crafting mechanic for the dwarfs, dwarf forging. We all expected, we all pretty much knew what that was going to be anyway when we saw it on the UI, but this does mean that just like the Tomb Kings and the Mortuary Cult, the dwarfs will be able to craft their own items, their own weapons, their own armors that they can equip on legendary lords and heroes. So we've got new units, Dark Elf Manticore, Feral version, new High Elf Mages are on the way, so Lord of Heavens, Lord of Shadows, very good addition. These are things that I would have liked to have seen a little bit earlier, honestly. High Elves should never have dropped with less Lords of Magic than the Empire had, but this does make sense. This is exactly what they did in game one. They continuously add those free LC sorcerer types on top of what's already existing in the game just to give us a little bit something extra to look forward to and the sorceress will also now get beasts and death so more lords of magic all around for both the high elves and the dark elves new landmark buildings sword of cane feature awesome just awesome i have no other adjective to describe it i think it will make for some really amazing gameplay and really cool role play if people like doing that kind of thing and i'm sure a lot of you guys do and then, of course, the 30th regiments of 30th anniversary regiments of renown that we've been waiting so long to finally get our hands on will finally be here. So, Wood Elves, Beastmen, and all those old world races will be getting regiments of renown alongside Norska. So, a ton of content incoming. I am super excited. Hopefully, we'll be able to show off some of that stuff very soon. Hope you guys enjoyed this look at what is coming in the Queen and the Crone and those campaigns. I'll see you all next time. Indie Pride, signing out for now.